That sounds exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> David Foster lived a very schizophrenic lifestyle. By day, he was a successful, sought-after Hollywood actor. But by night, he was driven into the dark and dangerous world of prostitution. As Janet White reports, without divine intervention from God, this son of a Presbyterian minister was destined for destruction. When I would be on the set, starring in a movie with NBC executives from New York all around me, telling me I was great and wonderful in the next James Dean, and then going out that night and prostituting. I was a professional actor by day, male prostitute by night. By day, David Foster was a rising star who basked in the bright lights of Hollywood. But by night, he lurked in the shadows of a dangerous underworld, gripped by an addiction he couldn't control. Both seemed unlikely places for the son of a Presbyterian minister. As a young boy, David loved the movies. It was there his dream to act was born. It put into me a desire to become an actor that I wasn't even aware of. One of the things I'd do is I'd go to the movies and I'd sit there all day long because um, it was a fantasy world. It was a world where things were okay. Everything was okay. There was always a happy ending. People loved each other. Unlike David's home, where he says he felt rejected by the most influential man in his life. I didn't have my dad be emotionally close to me like I longed for. And, and he didn't know that he needed to be doing that because his dad had never taught him how to do that. But, you know, I took that as a sign that he didn't love me. And needing a dad's love and affection and approval and modeling and all of that uh, caused me to look for it elsewhere. And I remember early on uh, looking at other fellows in, in uh, junior high school and high school, not to lust after them. There was nothing sexual about it. I was just looking for what it was in them that made them so happy and well-liked and popular. And um, I was looking for what was missing in me, in them. But David's fascination with men created inner turmoil. He spent his teenage years lonely and depressed, alienated from his father and from God. My dad, being a pastor and being Scottish, and uh, actually contributed to my um, disfavor of God. I, I associated my father with God. In college, heavy drug use freed him to act out his homosexual inclinations. And that led to such self-disgust, David wanted to end his life. I tried to take my life immediately after having that experience. And God did not allow it to happen again. It wasn't the first time David had attempted suicide. He had heard voices telling him to kill himself all of his life. But in every suicide attempt that failed, David saw the hand of God. He told me in each case, that he loved me by saving my life. And that got me interested in God again. That, that gave me a spark of hope. I would always go in, out into nature to find God. And I went to the pier in St. Petersburg one night to talk to him. And it turned out to be the place where male prostitutes hung out, which I did not know. David not only discovered this was where prostitutes hung out, he was accidentally mistaken as one. It just totally surprised me and it made me mad because I'd gone there to talk to God and here I am in the midst of male prostitutes and people thinking I'm one. David prostituted himself that night for the first time and he vowed it would be the last. Instead, it just caused a craving for more. For a kid who's always wanted an older man to hold them and to tell them they were wonderful and that they were okay, it was instantly addicting to me. After college, David concealed his life as a prostitute and went to Hollywood to pursue his dream to act. Unlike most aspiring actors, David's career quickly blossomed. In fact, the first part I ever read for, I got, and it was the starring role in a, in a movie. So I had one of those experiences you only read about. I ended up with the best agents in town, a string of national commercials, um, another starring role, uh, several feature roles, and being written up in the magazines about, and, and yet I would continue to be a male prostitute on the side. So I was like trying to destroy whatever success I was seeking. There was so much self-hatred in me. After several years in Hollywood, 
David's double life took its toll. He longed for spiritual fulfillment, so he searched to find God. Unfortunately, he was misled by a friend into a cult. But during this time, something very interesting happened in David's parents' life. In the meantime, my parents had gotten born again. My dad, my cold, severe dad, Scottish dad, had gotten born again at a charismatic convention of Presbyterians. So I started getting into my head that I had to go to Israel to find Jesus, because I was starting to doubt some of the things the guru was saying. David went to Israel and discovered things about Christ he never realized, especially Christ's love for him. I'm walking down the Mount of Olives, the last day I'm in Israel, tagging along behind this Christian tour group, getting myself a free tour. And, uh, and when, the, when the pastor leading the tour group would read from the Bible things Jesus said at various points on the Mount of Olives, I heard Jesus saying them to me. I instantly knew the Bible was literally the Word of God. I went into the Garden of Gethsemane, and I knelt at that rock, the very rock that Christ knelt at, and I prayed and I said, God, my guru can do miracles, and you can do miracles, and how am I supposed to know the difference? Who's of God and who's of Satan? And uh, he said to me, who proved his love for you? And, well, Jesus, obviously, he died on the cross. <laughs> There's the answer. David dedicated his life to Christ that day, and his life dramatically changed. David went back to Los Angeles, left the cult, and found a church home. His life grew spiritually, and through prayer, David was delivered from homosexuality. But David's complete deliverance came after he paid a surprise visit to his father's church. I was so transformed in my countenance, he didn't even recognize me. And he goes, oh, whoa, what has happened to you? And um, I said, you know, Dad, I'm born again. It was the first time I'd seen my dad weep. And we hugged. David and his father reconciled. Even though his father never lived to see it, David fulfilled his father's dream. He'd always wanted to have a son go to seminary. And he had four boys, and none of us had seemed interested. And he finally got to have his dream fulfilled. Today, David Foster is an ordained Episcopal priest with a ministry tailored for people struggling with sexual bondage. David believes his life is a message of God's faithfulness and redemption. God says uh, the generations of the unfaithful can go on for a few generations. The generations of the righteous are for a thousand generations. No matter how perverse your life has been, you can be the first of a generation, thousands of generations of righteous, if you'll just turn to God. David's mess became his message and his test became his testimony. Just like so many of our lives, we go through things. Sometimes you have a setback and then you take a step back and then you have another setback then you take a step back and you find yourself so far from your goals sometimes so far from God it's like the story in the Bible of the prodigal son he was given so much but he lost everything he had on riotous living lack of appreciation living so many of you are watching right now and you were raised in a Christian environment but you begin to take a setback and a step back and you feel like you're so far from your comeback I've got good news for you, just like David. While you're feeling the sting of your setback today, God is already preparing your comeback. Today is your day. Something big is going to happen for you. But you have to get to the point in your life where you are tired of being tired, tired of being regular, tired of getting by, just barely getting by. And just say, God, I need you to forgive me. That's what David did. He said, God, forgive me. Come into my life and change me. And then the second thing you need to do is you need to forgive yourself because so many people are caught in that shame game down on themselves. So David asked for forgiveness in the story we just watched and then he had to forget and then he went forward. I want to pray for you. I believe that God has a great plan for you. I believe that 1998 is your year. 1999 is going to get better and you're going to blast into the new millennium. Come on. You got to get up. You know why? 
because somebody out there needs you. Somebody's hurting worse than you are. So when you take that step back, don't sit in it. Let's have the comeback right now. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit about to touch you. He's going to change you. He's going to do something special in your life. If you've walked away from God, if you've never become a Christian before, we're going to pray right now. Just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Dear Jesus, come into my heart new and afresh. I know that I have been failing. That's why I need you. Just say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Change me from the inside out. Forgive me, God, so that I can go forward. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Mm -hmm. Terry, I believe that many people <clears throat> prayed that prayer. Mm -hmm. And just like David, they don't have to sit in their setback. That's right. But God has prepared their comeback. And you know, I think of how in the scriptures it says that the father saw the prodigal son coming while he was still a long oh. way off. And that's because he was watching for him. And you know, it's that awesome. way with God today for you. He sees where you are. So what you said to him is so significant about shame. You know, that's the tool of the enemy to keep us from coming back into the blessing of the Father. Do not let it hinder you. Corey Ten Boom used to say, there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. And so often sexual sins. And in this particular story, this man struggled with homosexuality. There are many sexual sins. Maybe you're hooked on pornography on the Internet. Maybe you're someone who is engaged in fornication outside of the, the covenant of marriage. Maybe you're someone involved in adultery. Maybe you've committed that just in your head by not being wholly, wholly committed to your marriage partner. God is so able to change that. That is nothing for him. He says in his word, is my arm too short exactly, for this? Exactly. It is not. And the enemy would like to come in and just say, you are the worst. Isn't that That's how right. people feel? Absolutely. But what a great testimony of him receiving God's forgiveness. Yes. And I call it cooperating with the comeback. Yes, you know, absolutely. Because a lot of people, God is trying to give them the comeback, but they won't cooperate with it. And a lot of you are watching right now, if you're in sexual temptation and you're saying, I really want to be there, but I know that I don't have it. You know what? You're right. You don't. Tim doesn't have it. I don't have it. You don't have it. That's a Holy Spirit work that happens within you. But first, you have to do what you're talking about. Exactly. You have to cooperate with what God is wanting to give you, what he's wanting to do in your heart and life. So even that pray about, just say to him, God, I want to be with you. I want to walk with you. And I don't know that I can do that. The Bible says, in our weakness, he's strong. So ask him to fill you with the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. That's where the strength will come from. It won't come from us because we get our act together. We don't have our act together. Even that God will supply for you. And if you think you're alone in that, you go to the book of Acts in the Bible and read about God's disciples and how when Jesus had been killed, they hovered in a little room, terrified, until the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. And then they began to change a nation. They were emboldened with what God mm -hmm. was doing in their hearts and lives. You know, if you find yourself in bondage to sexual sin in your life and in bondage to the shame that comes with it, I want to tell you about a book that was written, in fact, by the man whose story you just saw, David Foster. It's called Sexual Healing, God's Plan for the Sanctification of Broken Lives. And if you'll call our toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700, we'll tell you how you can get a hold of this book. And if you're someone who has friends struggling with this, this is for equipping the saints to do the ministry that we've been called to through the Word of God. You get a hold of this book, too. We really need this in the body of Christ. Yesterday, you mm -hmm. and I talked right. a lot about what God wanted to do in the hearts and lives of people. We talked about an alternative to the psychic hotline, and we mm -hmm. got an email question as a result of that, Tim. Right. A woman wrote in and said, what's wrong with the psychic hotline? Can you address that a little bit more? So will you mm -hmm. take a moment and you do that? You know what's amazing is that I've done a lot of research <clears throat> on this, and the, the psychic hotlines have a lot of what we would call born-again Christians who are calling them. Yes. And uh, a lot of that is because they're not informed. They don't understand that psychics from the Old Testament, as God would talk about them, it comes from sorcery and, and witchcraft. Yes. And it's a spirit of divination. It's the opposite of the gifts of the spirit found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So here are these people being used by the enemy mm -hmm. and the enemy is channeling through them and they are giving misinformation. Yeah. But what we need to see, Terry, is we need to see, as you know, the power of God within our churches yeah. so people can see the real and drop the counterfeit. 
even within the church that we can see the real. There are a lot of people in the church today, I think, giving counterfeit prophetic messages exactly. as well. There's really only one way to know the difference, and I think, and I'd like to know your thoughts on this. I think that's by being so in the presence of the one who is real that exactly. you can discern when it's not. Right. You have to learn to discern, and that is spending time with God. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says that the Lord glories in this, that we understand and know Him. Yeah. The word know is to, to yada him, to spend intimate time with him. And so as we get to know him, we then know the voice of God. Mm -hmm. and I think it's very important as Christians that even at times when we think we have a word for someone, yes. we better really know it's God. Yes. Because I think many times it's just our own biased opinion. And then we step out in that. So we have to be very careful in the way we use what we call the gifts of the Spirit. But yet they're so needed. So yes. I think like never before, we have to use the sixth sense, which is discernment, yes. and learn to discern in order to get through the times that we're living in. But the psychic hotline is not of God. Mm -hmm. In it fact, has God's to do pretty with the God adamant that we about serve. anything that has to do with divination, isn't he? He says people who practice such things will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Exactly. So it's a good thing. Go back in your concordance and look up uh, divination. There, there are words in there for the psychic that you can go back and find out for yourself what the Old Testament has to say. Exactly. You know, when we come back, we'll have... A